All right, so still here in Oshkosh uh, 2022, going to a deep dive here with Teal Jenkins of Skytrax. And I wanted to do a separate video just on the gearbox alone, because he spent a lot of time and learning about the engineering behind this, obviously before making his own. So Teal, introduce yourself quickly and let's dive right into this. Okay, Teal Jenkins with Skytrax, uh, the owner and originally started site Skytrax out here just out of necessity of uh, trying to get a propeller on my own aircraft. And uh, so just starting off here, this was our first gearbox that we designed for the Apex. And uh, it's a three gear gearbox because we want to get the propeller up closer to the head to make it easier to cowl, obviously, so a two gear gearbox would not work. Um, uh, the, the actual Apex engine has its own gear reduction drive in it. It's about 1.23 to 1. So obviously not enough for us. So that output is basically right here on the gearbox. The, a the, uh, the Apex engine has an internal dampener built into their output drive. So we made use of their dampener, come off of that with a gear and then an idler gear in the center and then the prop gear. The prop gear uh, has the uh, sprag in it to disengage and engage at the very low RPMs and start up to make that really smooth. Um, yeah, and that's about it for the Apex gearbox. So let's let's deep dive into this. This is the first one that you designed after reading about. What, what are some of the really important things that you learned in your research about gears and how they mesh, and about fluids and the, the type of viscosities, and also like the okay, so amounts of oil you need to use to keep it cool? Yeah. So what we first our first learning in the process is our first housing was basically you know, a block of aluminum with three cutouts for the three gears. And we were finding that the the oil heated up really, really quick. And we were getting uh, foaming of the oil because we always kept it suspension. So we added the reservoir on here with cooling fins and it's internally baffled. So the thing that we we learned is, is get the oil lubricating what you want it to and then get it off and get it to settle, separate air oil, and at the time, same time when it's separating air and oil, it's dissipating heat, it's getting rid of heat. So keeping the oil in, in suspension all the time. The other thing is we had trouble keeping the fluid in the box. You know, no matter what we did for a vent, it seemed like it, it would always go out until we created the internal baffling and the reservoir off to the side. As far as the gear tooth pressure angles and stuff like that, we started off with uh, straight cut gears and then we moved to helically cut gears just on the Apex gearbox, uh, primarily because at the, you know, they were a little bit more noisier on the Apex gearbox as opposed, we use straight cut gears on the other ones and they're not as noisier because the Apex, the pinion gear, the output shaft gear is such small in diameter that you have very little gear teeth in contact at the same time. But is, there, is there anything like mechanically or engineering wise wrong with that being noisy? Or is it just like to make it quieter? Well, operation? well, it's it, kind of cool it, sound like, like a supercharger has that sound. Right? right, yeah. So mechanically, there are some disadvantages to, uh, <laughs> there are some disadvantages. Uh, and you can get to the point where um, you have very few, you know, at, uh, very few gear teeth in contact at the same time. That's the, just because making it whiny or not, that was a sub product of it, making it quieter okay. with the helical cut gears. Um, but I was, was kind of worried about that small gear only having one and a half gear teeth in contact at the same time. So that's kind of like the reason that we went to helically cut gears. Now it, it did, did make it quieter and that made it a little bit better. Uh, but for the most part, with the propeller noise, the, all the other noise in the airplane and stuff like that, you really can't hear it too much. But early on testing, we did say, well, yeah, it did get quieter. And so we didn't currently, uh, we're not using uh, helically cut gears in the others because there's other byproducts with helically cut gears like axial loads and thrusts that you do introduce. So we haven't changed that over on our other gearboxes. Going back to the oils, what have you learned about the oils and viscosities? So, that's what <laughs> so for this particular use? gearbox on the Apex, I recommend uh, running uh, automatic transmission fluid. Really? Uh, primarily because of the viscosity and the sprag that we have in it. The, this gearbox does not require any extreme pressure oils or gear oils, and we find that especially people in cold, cold climates, they can get, this, get themselves in trouble on first startup with the really thick oil in it. Um, and since we don't have extreme gear pressure angles or 
or anything that requires the extreme pressure oils, it's just it's, it's more of a hindrance to possibly damage the sprag from the from the sprag skipping across the race instead of grabbing when it needs to. Okay. While while you're mentioning sprag, can you describe in like a minute or two what is a sprag and how does it engage the shaft? Okay. So it's, it's in this particular a sprag uh, is generically a one-way bearing, so it allows movement one way, but when you go to rotate in the other direction, it grabs. Uh, we use like a, a, a dog bone style of sprag. There's roller ramp sprags that use uh, rollers, and you can Google the different types of sprags and look that up. Okay. But we use the what's com real common in automatic transmission these days, which is a, a dog bone style of sprag. Okay. Kind of like different airfoils, there's different sprag designs. Yeah, it? exactly, yeah. Okay. Let's move on to the, the second iteration of your gearbox. Awesome. I'm at the airport a lot more these days editing and walking out of the FBO, out onto the ramp, it's bright. So I've been wearing my flying eyes eyewear a lot more these days. They're lightweight, extremely comfortable, flexible, and have micro thin temples that slip under your headsets. You like saving money? Get 10% off right now by using the code EXPERIMENTAL. Check out the links below. We are partnering with great companies like Dynon Avionics at Dynon.com. AirTech Coatings at AirTechCoatings.com. Clemens Insurance at ClemensInsurance.net. The Aviators Clinic at AviatorsClinic.com. Diamond Doors at DiamondDoors.com. Flying Eyes at FlyingEyesOptics.com. Foxtrot 95, Calhoun County Airport at FlyFoxtrot95.com. Take a moment to go visit their websites at the links found below in the description of this video. And visit our website at ExperimentalAircraftChannel.com for events, our video library arranged in easy to find playlists on specific topics, affiliate products, aviation merchandise, and so much more. All right, so moving on to the, the second gearbox you created. What's different about this one? So this is this gearbox is it's similar in that there's three main shafts, but on this one uh, we started the compound gearing. So the center shaft has two gears on it, and so we have two separate ratios from the first set to the second set, where the apex is just an idler to transfer the load, and that that does a couple of things for us. Uh, it, it that what we were talking about the gear tooth contact amount well you have two closer ratio of gears because we're going to be going you know four to one or three and a half to one like on the apex 3.83 to one it gives us so that you can step it down one and a half to one one and a half to one you can step it down slowly and have similar gear sizes so you don't have one really small pinion gear and a large bull gear and all the load a lot of the load being on the pinion gear the other thing that it does for us is that we can swap out gear ratios easier on one set of gears so you can take these two gears out and go to a different ratio where on the apex we really can't do that because we just have an idler shaft in the center and we don't compound gear it. So for, for clarity again, the first one had three gears, this has two? This still has, has three. This has four gears four, okay. and the center gears is compound. Compound gearing means you have two gears on a common shaft in different sizes. Right, yeah, so this one's internally baffled, similar to the apex. It's got some cooling fins on the front of it. It is also designed around the housing of the engine, so you can only mount this onto this particular engine because it's it's made the same housing shape and everything as the particular engine that it's made for. Would there be any reason to pull the oil out of the gearbox and externally uh, cool it like an oil cooler? We haven't found in these horsepower levels, especially in the 70 to 80 horsepower, if somebody wanted to get extreme with a phaser and put a turbo on it and do 110 horsepower, or 80 or 90 horsepower continuous, that may be something to consider, but we've never even gone close to that kind of horsepower, and I wouldn't really recommend. I think this engine, if keep it under about 75 horsepower, and this in it, the, the gearbox is not going to be a consideration of putting too much heat in it at all. Is there any um, consideration of the, the heat? Well, first of all, what does the, the gearbox create as far as heat internally? And then does that heat transfer into the engine? Um, I, don't, I don't have the BTU numbers on the top of my head exactly how much it is. Uh, I would have to refer back to some of our calculations early on, but 
it's, you know, as much heat as it is creating the surface area, the housing and these fins, the coolant, it stays pretty close, just under coolant temperature most of the time, okay. um, because there's so much heat transfer into the engine case, into the gearbox, more so. Opposite direction, it's yeah. not going this way, it's going that way. Exactly, yeah, okay. the engine is usually running slightly hotter than the gearbox, so we're pushing, we're dissipating heat out of the gearbox from the engine more than we're moving. This is acting like a heat sink to the engine. Exactly, yeah, so, and it, it, it seems like it, not a lot of people run the temperature indications on them right now, just because it, they've run so steadily. Um, but the, some of the guys make the argument, well, whenever my gearbox starts to fail, it's going to start heating up. And we haven't had one have that failure mode where they start getting hot. We've had a sprag lock up, but the, running a temperature indication for, you know, knowing that you're getting close to damage or something like that, or a chip detector, all the gearboxes has an eighth inch NPT plug so that you can add that kind of stuff to them later. But temperature really has never been an issue, except on the Apex gearbox in our early development before when we just had a pocket in there for each gear to fit and not necessarily a housing or any kind of baffling involved. Okay, and, and when this, you talk about the sprag and it failing, when it fails, it actually feels closed. So you still have power, it doesn't right. really fail in the other direction. Right, it will lock up, you won't notice it in flight, but whenever you land and you go to taxi in, it'll be a little bit rougher and you shut the engine off and the prop will be basically part of the engine. Now, not to say that sprags have not failed and slipped and and but any of our failures that we've had they just kind of lock up now you know sprags have been over the history of race cars and stuff like that and high horsepower applications they could possibly slip and you know continue to slip but for our application we haven't really seen that all right so moving on to the, the last and, and, and final iteration here and this one I'll do uh, kind of a zoomed in shot so you can see he's got a, a clear cover so you can see the the gears on this one but what are the, the final changes to for this so far? So this, this gearbox we're calling the Nitro gearbox. Um, we just generically called it because I kind of like the name Nitro for the snowmobile that one of the snowmobile models that it, this engine comes out of, but it's not limited to the Nitro. It's Nitro, Vector, Venture, Viper, and Arctic Cat. It's the ZR7000 or the ZR9000 if you want it turbocharged. You're naming your gearbox, not the engine. Yeah, exactly. And I, I guess I just like the name that Nitro, the cool. Nitro that Yamaha had, so it's not necessarily necessarily just the nitro snowmobile it's just generically what we call the nitro gearbox and it's for any of the three cylinder engines even the carbureted ones in 2005 2006 time frame but so with this engine very similar in that we compound gear it it's similar to our what we call the phaser gearbox for the 75 horsepower engine we have a compound uh, gear arrangement and we can easily see in here the the two gears through the polycarbonate housing um, but this one we kind of stepped it up even one notch more partially because on the three-cylinder engine Yamaha doesn't provide any kind of dampening for it and that's one reason you know and you think about three cylinders like oh man that's really rough and stuff well if Yamaha doesn't even dampen it you know but knowing our experience with the dampeners that was made for the phaser and the apex we wanted to create a dampener to ease the loads on our sprag because we're still using a sprag in this so we have a dampener right off the output which is in the end of the crankshaft there's a stub shaft that comes out the crankshaft doesn't stick out a stub shaft from the crankshaft sticks out so we put a dampener on the end of it and then as uh, Brian will get some close-up shots here in a little bit there's a, a spiral or a helix kind of cut on this dampener so that it, it acts as an oil pump. So oil gets pumped to the front of the housing. Some of the oil gets pumped through the dampener for cooling because there's a, for lack of, it's a hydrogenated dunal rubber inserts in here that we're cooling with the oil. And then we pump the oil up the housing and you can see the channel here uh, and it lubricates the center two bearings for the center shaft and then it continues up into the main thrust bearing uh, bearing housing and lubricates the thrust pressure lubed the, the the thrust bearing this is vented it has to be vented correct well this this is this engine what we're doing currently right now is we're venting it to the crankcase there's a there's a there's a line that runs on see what I've got a hose bar fitting right here so we equalize the pressure in the crankcase all of the three cylinders are unique over like the apex and that the crankcase on the apex has vented the atmosphere on the three-cylinder engines they use a scavenge pump to evacuate since it's a dry sump 
uh, they evacuate the crankcase pressure and cause a negative pressure on the crankcase. In fact, it's about a half an atmosphere, where if you're at you know sea level, the crankcase pressure is going to be about 15 inches of mercury as opposed to 29 inches whenever the engine's running. There's a lot of advantages to that in mechanical in that there's less windage losses in the crankcase and it's, it's better to have the crankcase under a negative pressure. The difference like between the Rotex as a 912 is also a dry sump but they use uh, piston blow-by. They don't have a separate pump, they use piston blow-by to force the oil into the to the oil bottle. That's the reason you you turn the engine over and what they call the burp, you know, check right. it. This one you would just want to start the engine up and run it for a minute or two and then check the oil because the scavenge pump needs to pump all the oil. But so we, as far as venting the gearbox, we match the pressure on the crankcase currently right now because we just didn't want a great negative pressure across the seal off the bottom where the engine would want to pull the oil inside there. Right. We're starting to find that the that the seals on the um, the stock seals and the bearing seals that Yamaha provides is a pretty good barrier. So we're thinking about revisiting that. Do we really need to vacuum the, the, the gearbox down to crankcase pressure right now? And we're starting to do some testing with atmospherically uh, venting the gearbox instead of equalizing uh, engine pressures. But currently, you know, because the other thing about m plugging this into your engine is you, we are seeing some oil vapor transfer from the gearbox to the engine. And that's one reason that we run the same oil uh, in this gearbox as engine oil. Whatever okay. you're running for engine oil, you're running this. So if you do get any kind of transfer... For, for lack of a better description, your mist is almost like condensing into the engine. Exactly, exactly.